So um, my name is Christine Ahn, and I um, founded an organization called the Korea Policy Institute. It's based in Los Angeles, and we actually moved here um, in August from Oakland, California, because my husband is starting a new community food systems program in partnership with Model Farms um, at the University of West Oahu. So we're um, really honored to be here, and thank you, Darlene and Nancy and the Hawaii People's Fund for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. They were saying it's really like laid back and informal and I had no idea so many people would come. So um, my talk is um, going to be a little bit complex because I'm kind of taking a step back. I think um, Hawaii is a very interesting and unique place given its kind of colonial history. And so I thought that um, I already, you know, I, I heard Lori Wallach was going to talk, and I've obviously worked for years with Lori Wallach um, on fighting free trade agreements. Actually, the the second largest free trade agreement since NAFTA is the Korea U.S. free trade agreement. Trade agreement. It was signed in 2011, and that was where Korean Americans for Fair Trade really organized to try to defeat it. So I know these ugly FTAs, but I. I think for me, it's personally helpful to have more of a geopolitical landscape in which these trade agreements are being pushed. Like, why is the Obama administration really trying to push this? So um, that's what I'm going to try to do. And since I only have 10 minutes, I'm going to, I kind of wrote a little script just so that I um, stay on time. So, um, so let's start with Hawaii. We, the people, obviously this is a very uh, conscious and educated group. So when the American missionaries, who were profiting handsomely from exporting sugar from Hawaii to the United States, this is in the 1800s, um, the U.S. Uh, Congress passed new laws that would um, increase tariffs on Hawaii sugar that was going to the mainland. This is before Hawaii was part of the United States. And so what did they do? The American missionaries went to Washington, D.C. They met with um, the state, the Secretary of State. They colluded with the Navy to essentially get the Navy to orchestrate a coup on Hawaii so that it could be annexed, so that they wouldn't have to pay any kind of tariffs on the export of sugar to the mainland. So I think that it's really interesting because Hawaii, of all people and of all places in the world, know how militarism and trade liberalization go hand in hand. So as Lori Wallach outlined, the trade, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, is not just about trade, but it's about a host of other things, including the containment of China. So in the fall of 2011, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, she outlined in this white paper called America's New Pacific Century, which is quite an affront because the last century and the previous century was really you know, America's imperial project into the Asia Pacific. But uh, in January 2012, this was more clearly outlined by President Obama, who issued a new defense strategic guidance called Sustaining U.S. Leadership, Priorities for the 21st Century Defense. It outlined the U.S.-Asia Pacific pivot, the region that will likely be the hub of economic activity for the 21st century. Let me just tell you why. In 2010, 61% of US goods exports and 72% of US agricultural exports worldwide went to the Asia Pacific. By 2015, East Asian countries are expected to surpass NAFTA and the Eurozone to become the world's largest trading bloc. Market opportunities will only increase as the region swells by the additional 175 million people by 2030, and with their economies maturing and the populations expanding, the countries of the Asia Pacific will thirst for more oil traded worldwide and, um, and natural resources, which will be mostly transported by sea. Today, about 15% of oil traded worldwide and more than half of the globe's merchant fleet tonnage flow through the Straits of Malacca, Sunda, and Lombok. Sorry, I don't have a map up, but these are in Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. This will funnel raw materials of the Middle East and Africa into the booming East Asian economies. So the main driver of the Asia Pacific pivot, as I know we have lots of experts in this room that know about the Asia Pacific, is to contain a rising China. Well, why? Why is China such a threat to the United States? Let me just give you some stats. China has become the second largest 
economy in the world eclipse, eclipse Japan and is set to eclipse the U.S. in a few years. China runs trade surpluses with most industrialized capitalist countries in the world, including a $200 billion trade surplus with the United States. It holds $1 trillion in U.S. Treasury bonds. In other words, it has become the banker for the United States government. China has become the central hub of economic activity, now rivaling the U.S. and the EU. China is the main trading partner with Latin America and has eclipsed the United States as Africa's single largest trading partner. See, this is part of its go-out strategy. Um, going out by sea to explore new economic relationships to secure a steady flow of raw materials, oil, and natural gas. It is competing with the U.S. for these markets and for inputs. So in response to the Obama administration's Asia-Pacific pivot, China has expanded its military budget spending. In 2013, it will have increased its spending by 10% on an annual basis, and it's been about 9% for the last decade. And according to a study commissioned by the U.S. Department of Defense, and I say that because it was SICE, Johns Hopkins SICE that actually did the study, but it was commissioned by the State Department. So we have to think about what is the motive of this. But, quote, China's defense spending is projected to be on par with the United States at some point in the next 15 to 20 years, which we know is sick. $640 billion annually. The U.S. outspends the world, the rest of the world combined in military spending. So there are two key pillars of the Obama administration's Asia-Pacific policy. One is military, the other is economic. The U.S. already has 320,000 troops throughout the Asia-Pacific. And with the pivot, it is sending more troops to new bases, such as 2,500 Marines to Australia, reestablishing the use of bases in places like the Philippines after it was kicked out, and planning to move 8,000 troops from Okinawa to Guam and to Hawaii. It is conducting joint military exercises with countries throughout the region, South Korea, Japan, um, India, even Vietnam. Can you believe that? I mean, it was just, I think in 2010, it normalized relations with, with Vietnam, and now they're conducting joint military exercises. I, this kind of blew my mind. In 2012, the US conducted the massive, quote, Cobra Gold military exercises. It involved Thailand, Korea, Japan, Singapore, Indonesia, and Malaysia, and observers from more than 20 other countries, including Myanmar. It included over 20,000 soldiers. Yeah, China is like, hello. This is really, really serious. So it has also been a field day for US manufacturers. Um, according to Reuters, in 2012, 2012 alone, despite the slow growth, quote, sales agreements with countries in the U.S. Pacific Command's area of activity rose to $13.7 billion, um, up 5% from the year before. So they are just like, bring it on. Bring on the militarization. Bring on the Asia-Pacific pivot. By 2020, 60% of the U.S. military will be based in the Asia-Pacific. Um, this... Professor Am uh, at Amherst, his name is Michael Clare. I don't know if you guys have read his stuff. He, he writes really good stuff about natural resource, the competition for natural resources. But this is what he says. He says, quote, for China, all this spells potential strategic impairment. Although some of China's imported oil will travel over land through pipelines from Kazakhstan and Russia, the great majority of it will still come by tanker from the Middle East, Africa, and Latin America over sea lanes policed by the US Navy. Indeed, almost every tanker bringing oil to China travels across the South China Sea, a body of water the Obama administration is now seeking to place under effective naval control, end quote. Well, the U.S. job is made that much easier by exploiting territorial disputes. Do you remember last week, all the stuff like China saying, okay, now this is our new air force, and they have sustained their villages for centuries by just the sheer breath, their, the, the strength of their lungs. They don't use any scuba equipment. They just use these masks and like pantyhose as like their, um, as their like wetsuit. And they die, they hold their breaths for like two to three minutes as they forage in a very conservationist way the, the seafood to feed their families. And so um, I think just like the sick, sickness of it all, I'm just gonna, kind of give like an outline of this. Okay, so the Korea-US free trade agreement is the second largest free trade agreement 
we have a lot to learn from that experience about what's going to be in the TPP. So here is South Korea. And what we have to think about in these free trade agreements is they're capitalists from each country. Yes, like the developing countries are going to get screwed. Of course. I mean, it's like the U.S. is such a litigious nation and has such expertise and like an army of lawyers ready to like sue every country. Um, but it's also the capitalists within those countries. It's like a compromise. So in the Korea Free Trade Agreement, the U.S., pharmaceutical industry and insurance industry, they had a lot to gain in essentially opening South Korea's market. South Korea, they were like, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll jeopardize, we'll sacrifice our farmers. 40% um, of Korea's farmers will disappear because of the Korea Free Trade Agreement. This is from a government study. Um, $626 million annual revenue lost to South Korea's ag industry because of this free trade agreement. It's going to be killed by uh, the U.S. ag industry. So the logic is that, okay, well, we're just going to like export more cell phones and Samsung and, and you know, in exchange, well, you know, we're going to like lose our food sovereignty. So it's like 80% of food is imported. So very similar to Hawaii, right? Like 90% is food. So we'll just import, uh, you know, most of the food. We'll do all these like land grabs, you know, so you know about Korea being involved, like the U.S. and all these other wealthy countries because of the food price crisis and they're, they're facing food insecurity. So they're going to go and try to like buy countries like Madagascar to ensure a steady supply of food. And so that's, that's the sick logic. And so this is where the militarism comes in because they're so dependent on trade, on the travel of food by sea. They need to protect their sea lanes. Sea lanes. And how do they do that? They need to increase their naval Air Force, they need to militarize their country. That's going to that's going to ensure the security of their nation and the people. How sick is that? And so you have a place like Jeju Island, which is this paradise island, which is essentially self-sufficient island, and you're putting a U.S. naval base there that is connected to the U.S. missile defense system, that is connected to that, and that the South Korean government uses and says. We need it because we need to ensure this flow of raw materials, of energy, of food for our national security. I think we have to really deconstruct this, break this apart, because it is so deep and it is so threatening the future of, of any nation's sovereignty and the sustainability and viability of our world. So thank you. I know it's like complex and I, I traverse a lot, but... I, I could feel that you guys were following me and you understand the implications of, of this. Thank you. Thank you.